let me go ahead and turn my Bluetooth thing on here, y'all. Uh, that may that might help. Love this phone. So uh, if you guys out there can hear me loud and clear in the chat, if you could just give me a maybe a thumbs up or five thumbs downs. So I don't know what. Uh, wow. Okay, so it's playing a commercial on my end. Sorry, guys. I promise I'm coming here. Just give me un momento, por favor. Uh, but welcome, welcome everybody. I hope you guys are having a fantabulous Monday morning. Um, you know, you might well just um, might as well do a live stream at twelve oh five a.m. on Monday. Actually, spent the last two hours or so recording this. I was going to do it as a video, and of course, what happened was uh, I recorded about two minutes of it, and it. Um, my phone ran out of space. So I was just sitting there just talking and doing a real good job of this thing for like an hour and a half and nothing. So I figured I might as well just go ahead and do it as a stream, you know? Um, so hopefully, can, can y'all hear me okay though? I don't, uh, I don't know how to look in the chat from here, but if you guys grift on, okay. So I think that is an affirmative that we are live, loud and clear. And I'm going to unplug this phone for the time being so I have a little bit more range of motion. Um, so hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Um, this is going to be uh, an addition, a new addition to the uh, Revelation of the Spirit series that I've been doing over the last year or so, uh, Discernment of the Gospel. Um, tonight, we're going to delve into some of the uh, so-called Gnostic texts and uh, just... Uh, just see where it takes us. I do have a pretty well uh, cut and dried plan of where I want to go with it. Um, like I said, I just got done doing like an hour and a half recording of the same exact thing, and it was pretty much for nothing. So unlike any of my other streams, I've actually practiced a bit for this one. So it should be way better than any of my ever, other streams ever, right? So that's uh, that should be good. So greetings from Germany. What's up, Germania KS? Uh, having a cup of coffee. Hey, you know what? That sounds like a brilliant idea. Hey, uh, babes, Amina, would you mind whipping up some coffee for us, please, baby? When you get a chance. It doesn't have to be right now. Just when you get it. Thank you, dear. Appreciate it. Don't you just love it? Love the Goyles. Love the Goyles. I mean, I would totally so do it for her if she was streaming. Um, yeah, we are, uh, we are okay. We are okay. Um, thank God, man, uh, we were able to, uh, to keep the hotel room. So, uh, that, that has just been taken care of as of literally the last two yeah. minutes. So that, that is, um, that's a blessing, man. I mean, never take it for granted that, uh, a roof over your head and a warm blanket and a butt mutt. Everybody say hi to butt mutt. There's butt mutt. Hey, remember. Now I got to make sure you have your butt mutt. Uh, home is where your butt mud is, right? So, okay, uh, looks like we've got uh, everybody that's going to pop in for now that that is popped in. So uh, we'll go ahead and we will get started. Um, and now I did have this set up as like a video format, so forgive the cheese on my end if it seems a little bit uh, narrated. But uh, I, well, I'm narrating this for you guys live, so you should feel less stupid than me. Um, Hey, KS Germania, no worries, man. Everything is okay. Um, like I said, I, we've got a roof and a butt mutt. George. What more can a man ask for? This dog? Well, my dog is a Shih Tzu Cockaniel Poodle Mix. She's a Shih Tzu Cockapoo. She's a butt mutt. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Okay. So, but anyway, blessings and greetings to you guys, brothers and sisters. Uh, it's, it's with really a great gladness that I bring to you um, another controversial entry into the discernment of the gospel series uh, during what I opine to be this late hour of revelation and of tribulation, in many cases, for some of us. Um, if you've been lucky enough to have been granted uh, revelation without the pains of tribulation, I pray that you remain somewhat sheltered from the pain that often comes along with the trials of the Spirit. Um, it is with good faith that I relay not all of our spirits need be tried by the fires of tribulation, and <clears throat> if I could do anything to spare even one or all such pains, I would do it gladly. Uh, are we live? Yes, we are live. Yes, uh, level-headed. 
Um, today we're going to pick up a few loose ends, <clears throat> excuse me, of previous sections of this series, again, discernment of the gospel series, Revelation of the Spirit, and delve deeper into the working hypothesis that I've been presenting to you guys in small doses, which is to say uh, the early actual Christian church was essentially snuffed out and replaced with an imposter church, which we still have to this day. Um, the Apostle Paul who never met nor knew Christ and also murdered Christians for fun uh, and for a living, for mammon. Uh, Paul is responsible for about a half of the New Testament's books. And uh, when I make that claim, everyone always tries to explain to me that, yeah, well, he wasn't writing the Bible in his letters, which is true. So he wasn't like intentionally writing the Bible in those letters. But the fact still remains that his writings, in fact, dominate the New Testament, like about half of the books, while others like Thomas, Judas, Marys, and, and others are just flatly omitted from the, uh, the New Testament altogether. So, you know, make that uh, make of that what you will. Uh, excuse me, I got to get stuff out of the way whenever it pops on. So uh, the first bit of housekeeping, if I failed to mention this in a previous section, is the fact that um, many people have tried to tell me that the book of Acts was not actually written by Paul, which is something that I mentioned in, I think, the very first video in this series. Uh, but instead, it was written by Luke. Now, the reasoning behind that claim of theirs is pretty flimsy. Uh, you know, it was like it was written in Greek. But in fact, there is no author attributed to the book of Acts. And so uh, you could say it's a coin toss as to whether Luke or Paul or maybe someone else altogether wrote it. But I'm going to go out on a limb and state unequivocally that Paul had a hand in it. OK, maybe he wrote it whole cloth, but I, I would lean towards Paul sort of played the editor in chief for whoever wrote Acts. But th that Paul's signature, you know, hypothetically or like. Uh, metaphorically speaking, is uh, is in there. Uh, well, Tartaria may uh, dovetail into this, brother man, but this is something else in, entirely. Um, if you came here for mud flood stuff tonight, it's probably not going to be too mud floody, but it's uh, interesting stuff nonetheless. I mean, I am known to draw on about nonsense, but I don't just do live streams for just no reason at all. So, um, yeah, I wish I could hide the chat. No offense or anything, guys, but I'm I'm trying to like read this and I keep seeing things pop up here and I'm way too stupid to have so many conflicts going on at once. It's like totally all me. Um, but anyway, so back on point here. Um, uh, so p people sort of uh, were just dissing me because I made the claim in the first series of video in the series that Acts was written by Paul. And um, I would say that nobody knows for sure who wrote Acts, although I'm going to go go ahead and say that Paul had at least a hand in it. Um uh, the, the big reason for that, and again, this is circumstantial, but when, when Acts opens up, the book is addressed in the very first line. It is addressed to a man named Theophilus or Theophilus, who is um, – now, nobody really knows who Theophilus or Theophilus is, but potentially it, it makes a lot of sense that the one that, that the guy they're talking about is a very close relative of Caiaphas – uh, and Caiaphas was the Sadducee responsible for really spearheading the murder of Christ. Okay, so if it is Paul addressing this letter to Theophilus, the brother of Caiaphas, that actually makes a lot of sense because Paul would have been, you know, grease and elbows with Caiaphas and Theophilus, uh, Theophilus, and, and those guys regularly. So it does make a bit of sense in that respect. Um, also, there are certain elements of the book, like I think starting in, in chapter 5, verse 5, where uh, things just take an absolute 180 degree turn from the spirit of Acts towards another direction. We'll, we'll get into that, I promise. Um, but for all the people in the comments who claimed that my understanding of the Bible was null and void because Paul didn't write Acts, you're merely operating on popular opinion, not fact. And I simply refuse to believe that Luke wrote Acts, at least in its entirety, when it was, uh, in my opinion, clearly written from the point of view of Paul in many cases. So, in other words, uh, certain portions of Acts are written 
from a point of view that only Paul would have known and certainly not Luke. Uh, and we'll get into that. Maybe not even today. This might actually bleed over into another section because there's a lot of stuff I'm going to cover here. I promise I just did it like an hour ago and it didn't record. So anyway, before we get started, I'm going to read the Revelation of Paul, which is one of those so-called Gnostic texts, which means it was very likely or highly probably part of the actual teachings of the early church. Um, this account, how Paul was tapped by a spirit being to take over the fledgling church, infiltrate its ranks, and begin erecting hierarchical structures within it, just as Christ told his disciples not to do, right? The only tradition or ritual handed down to the apostles by Christ that we know for sure was communion. It was to break bread and drink wine together as a family in love and remembrance of him. And anyone who does that, Christ is there in your presence. Like, that's what he told us. Anyone who wants to add rituals and titles and power structures to hierarchy of the church is, in my opinion, anti-Christian. So that's exactly what it appears Paul did. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and start with the Apocalypse Revelation of Paul. But before we do, um, this is the Apocalypse of Paul is part of the Nag Hammadi Library. And so what is the Nag Hammadi Library? Well, I'll tell you. And I'm reading from gnosis.org here. This is not me. I'm quoting a, a site here. Uh, the Nag Hammadi Library is a collection of 13 ancient books called codices or codexes, right? Codices uh, pertaining, uh, uh, containing over 50 texts. Um, this was discovered in Upper Egypt in 1945, if you can believe it. Um, this immensely important discovery includes a large number of primary Gnostic Gospels, uh, texts which were once thought to have been entirely destroyed during the early Christian struggle to define orthodoxy. Now, on this site here, the phrase define orthodoxy is a euphemism for survive the onslaught of Roman uh, destruction, right? Because that's what it was. Um, Rome and the hierarchy of the uh, Hebrew temple went tooth and nail after not only Christians themselves, like murdering them, uh, but also their teachings. Uh, they made it illegal to teach anything but what uh, ultimately Rome officially decreed as gospel. Um, but before they even did that, I mean, it was just like kill the Christians and burn their books. I mean, they they went to great lengths to try to stamp out the original teachings of Christ and the original doctrines of the early actual church, right? And we're not talking about a church that has buildings and brick and mortar um, hierarchies and stuff like that. We're talking about uh, in here, you know, the church is the spirit that dwells within us all, right? So um, now... Also, the, the fact that it was discovered in 1945 and it was only completed uh, being uh, translated in the 1970s has provided impetus to a major reevaluation of early Christian history and the nature of Gnosticism. Okay, so I, I also think that it is right on time for the season of Revelation that we find ourselves in now. Um, 1945 is a blink of an eye in terms of history, especially if we go with the standard narrative that we're talking about 2,000 years ago when this stuff happened. Maybe it was I 1,000 years ago, right? I mean, I, I'm up on that stuff too, right? Maybe it wasn't 2,000 years ago. Maybe it was much less. But um, according to the standard narrative, that's what they say. So it is, um, it is nice and reassuring that um, – well, let me put it this way – so many people make the claim or make the statement that uh, God's word will never be snuffed out by the uh, efforts of man. And I will say that's true. And that's why we have things like the Nag Hammadi text being discovered in 1945. Now, I also will make this caveat that I don't necessarily adhere to and believe all of the Nag Hammadi text to be official, right? Like it seems to me some of them are peppered in there as um, red herrings or maybe they were just books that were interesting to the dude that had these other Christian scripts with it. Um, but the fact remains, there there are some very interesting books in the Nag Hammadi text that um, we just can't overlook. Not if you are after the truth, which is what we were charged to do by the master. So without further ado, the Apocalypse of Paul. 
Um, now, by the way, a lot of these codices have text missing because, well, they're very old. They were, people tried to destroy them. And what we do have left, um, it's a shame. It's a crying ass shame, but there's, there's a lot of stuff missing. And so the, the ones that I'm going to read from tonight, they don't have too much, um, you know, like text missing. But when you hear me say in a sort of hushed tone, text missing, what that means is like the words weren't there in the original Sanskrit or whatever language Greek, whatever it was found in. I guess it would have been, uh, yeah, Sanskrit. Here, I'll show you. Like, if you can see that there, like, that's what they looked like. It was a uh, little papyrus pages, right? And I guess it would be Sanskrit. Anyway, uh, so text missing the road. And he spoke to him saying, by which road shall I go up to Jerusalem? And the little child replied saying, say your name so that I may show you the road. The little child knew who Paul was. He wished to make a conversation with him through his words in order that he might find an excuse for speaking with him. The little child spoke saying, I know who you are, Paul. You are the one who was blessed from his mother's womb. For I have come to you that you may go up to Jerusalem to your fellow apostles. And for this reason you were called, and I am the spirit who accompanies you. Let your mind awaken, Paul, with text missing, for text missing, whole which text missing, among the principalities and these authorities and archangels and powers and the whole race of demons, text missing, the one that reveals bodies to a soul seed. And after he brought that speech to an end, he spoke, saying to me, Let your mind awaken, Paul, and see that this mountain upon which you are standing is the mountain of Jericho, so that you may know the hidden things in those that are visible. Now it is to the twelve apostles that you shall go, for they are elect spirits, and they will greet you. He raised his eyes and saw them greeting him. Then the Holy Spirit, who was speaking with him, caught him up on high to the third heaven, and he passed beyond to the fourth heaven. The Holy Spirit spoke to him, saying, Look, and see your likeness upon the earth. And he looked down, and he saw those who were upon the earth. He started and saw those who were upon the text missing. Then he gazed down and saw the twelve apostles at his right and at his left in the creation. And the Spirit was going before them. But I saw in the fourth heaven, according to class, I saw the angels resembling small g gods and the angels bringing a soul out of the land of the dead. They placed it at the gate of the fourth heaven and the angels were whipping it. The soul spoke saying, what sin was it that I committed in this world? The toll collector who dwells in the fourth heaven replied saying, it was not right to commit all those lawless deeds that are in the world of the dead. You can say that in there. Thanks. The soul replied saying, thank you, dear. The soul replied saying, bring witnesses. Let them show you in what body I committed lawless deeds. Do you wish to bring a book to read from? Uh, bear with me one second. Okay. Cheers. Mm, that's good, baby. Thank you. And the three witnesses came. The first spoke saying, was I not in the body the second hour? Text missing. I rose up against you until you fell into anger and rage and envy. And the second spoke saying, was I not in the world? And I entered at the fifth hour and I saw you and desired you. And behold, then now I charge you with the murders you committed. The third spoke, saying, Did I not come to you at the twelfth hour of the day when the sun was about to set? I gave you darkness until you should accomplish your sins. When the soul heard these things, it gazed downward in sorrow, and then it gazed upward. It was cast down. The soul that had been cast down went to a body which had been prepared for it, and behold, its witnesses were finished. Then I... Paul, gazed upward and saw the Spirit saying to me, Paul, come, proceed towards me. Then as I went, the gate opened, and I went up to the fifth heaven. 
and I saw my fellow apostles going with me while the Spirit accompanied us. And I saw a great angel in the fifth heaven holding an iron rod in his hand. There were three other angels with him, and I stared into their faces, but they were rivaling one another with whips in their hands, goading the souls on to the judgment. But I went with the Spirit, and the gate opened for us. Then we went up to the sixth heaven, and I saw my fellow apostles going with me, and the Holy Spirit was leading me before them. And I gazed up on high and saw a great light shining down on the sixth heaven. And I spoke, saying to the toll collector who was in the sixth heaven, Open to me in the Holy Spirit who is before me. And he opened to me. Then he went up to the seventh heaven, and I saw an old man, text missing, light, and whose garment was white. His throne, which was in the seventh heaven, was brighter than the sun by seven times. The old man spoke, saying to me, Where are you going, Paul, O blessed one and the one who was set apart from his mother's womb? But I looked at that spirit, and he was nodding his head, saying to me, Speak with him. And I replied, saying to the old man, I'm going to the place from which I came. And the old man responded to me, Where are you from? But I replied, saying, I'm going down to the world of the dead in order to lead captive the captivity that was led captive in the captivity of Babylon. The old man replied to me, saying, How will you be able to get away from me? Look and see the principalities and authorities. The spirit spoke, saying, Give him the sign that you have, and he will open for you. And then I gave him the sign. He turned his face downwards to his creation and to those who are his own authorities. And just a side note, this is just my little commentary here. It makes you wonder what that sign was. And I submit, could it possibly have been something like the Seal of Solomon, which is a pentangle and used to essentially control demons? What is the lore, right? So anyway, back to the the book here. This is almost over. This part's almost over. And the seventh heaven opened, and we went up to Ogdoad. And I saw the twelve apostles. They greeted me, and we went up to the ninth heaven. I greeted all those who were in the ninth heaven, and we went up to the tenth heaven. And I greeted my fellow spirits. The Apocalypse of Paul. Now, I will say real quick, I'm not going to testify that this is legitimate, uh, you know, legitimate uh, canon or writings of the Apostle Paul, but it could be. And the fact that it was, um, that you won't find anything close to this in any of the books of the New Testament is interesting, just, you know, thought and point, right? So, so we covered the uh, Nagamati overview, we covered the Apostle Paul. So let's go now back to my little notes here. So it seems that according to the early church, uh, Paul was not welcomed into the upper echelons of the Christian church by the resurrected Christ, as it is told on the Road to Jericho uh, story, right? But according to this, it appears it was instead given uh, other worldly powers to commandeer and infiltrate the fledgling church by a being of another ilk altogether. But how is it possible that the apostles of Christ could be tricked by someone like Paul who was possibly emboldened by what seems to have been a fallen angel disguising itself as an angel of light to Saul, the murderer and torturer of Christians. Well, this is just a working theory again, but if the apostles murdered Judas Iscariot after he sold out the master, they would have probably lost some favor with the Most High and left themselves open to demonic attack. Now, this is not spelled out in uh, canonical scripture, but that doesn't mean it isn't a possibility. Um, One of the very important Gnostic texts, the Gospel of Judas, shows that Judas was the only one of the apostles who was capable of the unthinkable and terrible task of, you know, turning over their beloved and uh, wonderful master, Yeheshua, to the Romans to be put to death, okay, for 30 bucks, right, or whatever. So let's go ahead and read the Gospel of Judas, and this one is uh, not of the uh, Nag Hammadi text. 
this is of uh, another finding altogether, but it is in the uh, sort of Gnostic accepted text. So um, I'll just read a little background on the Gospel of Judas. The following translation has been committed to the public domain. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I wanted to tell you where it was discovered and who translated it when, but I don't have that in front of me. So just look it up. Gospel of Judas, right? So here we go. Uh, this is the secret message of judgment, which Jesus spoke with Judas Iscariot over a period of eight days three days before he celebrated Passover. So this would have been right before the Last Supper, over a period of several days. Uh, when he appeared on earth, he did signs and great wonders for the salvation of humanity. Some walked in the way of righteousness, but others walked in their transgressions. So the twelve disciples were called. He started to tell them about the mysteries beyond the world and what would happen at the end. Often, he didn't reveal himself to his disciples in his regular form, but they would find him in their midst as a child. One day, he was with his disciples in Judea. He found them sitting together, practicing their piety. When he came up to his disciples, sitting together, praying over the bread, he laughed. The disciples said to him, Master, why are you laughing at our prayer? What have we done? This is what's right. And he answered and said to them, I'm not laughing at you. You're not doing this because you want to, but because through this, your God will be praised. And they said, Master, you, text missing, are the son of our God. Jesus said to them, how do you know me? Truly, I say to you, no generation of the people among you will know me. When his disciples heard this, they started to get angry and furious and started to curse him in their hearts. But when Jesus noticed their ignorance, he said to them, Why are you letting your anger trouble you? Has your God within you and his stars become angry with your souls? If any of you is strong enough among humans to bring out the perfect humanity, stand up and face me. All of them said, We're strong enough, but their spirits weren't brave enough to stand before him, except Judas Iscariot. He was able to stand before him, but he couldn't look him in the eye, so he looked away. Uh, Judas said to him, I know who you are and where you've come from. You've come from the immortal realm of Barbello, and I'm not worthy to utter the name of the one who sent you. Then Jesus, knowing that he was thinking about what is exalted, said to him, Come away from the others, and I'll tell you the mysteries of the kingdom. Not so that you'll go there, but you will grieve much because someone else will replace you to complete the 12 elements before their God. Judas said to him, when will you tell me these things and when will the great day of light dawn for that generation? Text missing. But when he said these things, Jesus left him. The next morning he appeared to his disciples, and they said to him, Master, where did you go, and what did you do when you left us? And Jesus said to them, I went to another great and holy generation. His disciples said to him, Lord, what generation is better and holier than us? That's not in these realms. Now when Jesus heard this, he laughed. He said to them, Why are you wondering in your hearts about the strong and holy generation? Truly, I say to you, no one born of this realm will see that generation. No army of angels from the stars will rule over it. And no person of mortal birth will be able to join it because that generation doesn't come from text missing that has become text missing. The generation of the people among them is from the generation of the great people text missing, the powerful authorities who text missing, nor the powers, text missing, those by which you rule. When his disciples heard these things, they were each troubled in their spirits. They couldn't say a thing. Another day, Jesus came up to them, and they said to him, Master, we've seen you in a dream because we had great dreams last night. But Jesus said, why, text missing, hidden yourselves? 
And they said, We saw a great house with a great altar within it, and twelve people, we'd say they were priests, and a name. And a crowd of people was waiting at the altar until the priests had finished receiving the offerings. And we kept waiting too. Jesus said, Well, what were they like? And they said, some fasted for two weeks, others sacrificed their own children, others sacrificed their wives, praising and humbling themselves among each other, others slept with men, others murdered, and yet others committed many sins and did criminal things. And the people said before the altar, invoke your name. And in all their sacrificing, they fill the altar with their offerings. And when they said this, they fell silent because they were troubled. Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? Truly, I say to you, all the priests standing before that altar invoke my name. And again, I say to you, my name has been written on this house of the generations of the stars by the human generations, and they have shamefully planted fruitless trees in my name. Jesus said to them, you are the ones receiving the offerings on the altar you've seen. That's the God you serve, and you are the 12 people that you've seen. And the animals you saw brought in to be sacrificed are the crowd which you lead astray. Before that altar, your ministry will stand up and use my name like that, and the generations of the pious will be loyal to him. After him, another person will present those who sleep around, and another those who murder children, and another those who sleep with men, and those who fast, and the rest of impurity, crime, and error, and those who say, we're equal to the angels." They are the stars that finish everything. It's been said to the human generations, Look, God has accepted your sacrifice from the hands of priests, that is, the minister of error. But the Lord who commands is the Lord over everything. On the last day, they'll be found guilty. Jesus said to them, Stop sacrificing animals. You've offered them over to the altar, over your stars with your angels, where they've already been completed. So let them become, text missing, with you, and let them become clear. His disciples said to him, Cleanse us from our sins that we've committed through the deceit of the angels. Jesus said to them, It's not possible, text missing, nor can a fountain quench the fire of the entire inhabited world, nor can a city's well satisfy all the generation's thirst, except the great stable one. A single lamp won't illuminate all the realms, except the second generation, nor can a baker feed all creation under heaven. And when the disciples heard these things, they said to him, Master, help us and save us. Jesus said to them, uh, sorry, let me adjust here, you guys. Oof, I'm so sorry. Okay. So Jesus said to them, stop struggling against me. Each one of you has his own star and text missing of the stars will text missing what belongs to it text missing. I wasn't sent to the corruptible generation, but to the strong and incorruptible generation, because no enemy has ruled over that generation, nor any of the stars. Truly, I say to you, the pillar of fire will fall quickly, and that generation won't be moved by the stars. And when Jesus said these things, he left, taking Judas Iscariot with him. He said to him, the water on the exalted mountains is from, text missing. It didn't come to water the well of the tree of the fruit, text missing, of this realm, text missing, after a time, text missing, but came to water God's paradise and the enduring fruit because it won't corrupt that generation's walk of life, but it will exist for all eternity. Jesus said to him, tell me what kind of fruit does this, I'm sorry, Judas said to him, tell me what kind of fruit does this generation have? (laughs) 
And Jesus said, the souls of every human generation will die. However, when these people have completed the time in the kingdom and the spirit leaves them, their bodies will die, but their souls will live and they'll be taken up. Judas said, what will the rest of the human generations do? And Jesus said, it's not possible to sow on rock and harvest its fruit. In the same way, it's not possible to sow on the defiled race along with the perishable wisdom and the hand which created mortal humans so that their souls may go up to the realms above. Truly, I say to you, no ruler, angel, or power will be able to see the places that this great and holy generation will see. When Jesus said this, he left. Judas said, Master, just as you've listened to all of them, now listen to me too, because I've seen a great vision. But Jesus laughed when he heard this, and he said to him, Why are you all worked up, you thirteenth demon? But speak up, and I'll bear with you. Jesus said to him, in the, I'm sorry, Judas, it's a little far away now. Sorry, I keep misreading their names. They're so similar. Okay, Judas said to him, in the vision, I saw myself. The 12 disciples are stoning me and chasing me rapidly. And I also came to the place where I had followed you. I saw a house in this place and my eyes couldn't measure its size. Great people surrounded it, and that house had a roof of greenery. In the middle of the house was a crowd. Master, take me in with these people. And Jesus answered and said, Your star has led you astray, Judas Iscariot, and that no person of mortal birth is worthy to enter the house you've seen, because that place is reserved for those who are holy. Neither the sun nor the moon will rule there, nor the day, but those who are holy will always stand in the realm with the holy angels. Look, I've told you the mysteries of the kingdom, and I've taught you about the error of the stars, and, text missing, sent on high over the twelve realms. Judas said, Master, surely my seed doesn't dominate the rulers, does it? Jesus answered and said to him, Come, let me tell you about the holy generation, not so that you'll go there, but you will grieve much when you see the kingdom and all its generation. When Judas heard this, he said to him, What good has it done me that you've separated me from that generation? Jesus answered and said, You will become the thirteenth, and you will be cursed by the other generations and will rule over them. In the last days, they will text missing to you, and you won't go up to the holy generation. Jesus said, come, and I'll teach you about the mysteries that no human will see, because there exists a great and boundless realm whose horizons no angelic generation has seen, in which is a great invisible spirit which no angelic eye has ever seen, nor heart has ever comprehended, and it's never even been called by a name. And a luminous cloud appeared there, and he, the spirit, said, Let an angel come into being to attend me. And a great angel, the self-begotten, the God of the light, emerged from the cloud. And because of him, another four angels came into being from another cloud, and they attended the angelic self-begotten. And they said, the self-begotten, let a realm come into being, and it came into being just as he said. And he created the first luminary to rule over it. And he said, let angels come into being to serve it. And myriads without number came into being. And he said, let a luminous realm come into being, and it did. He created the second luminary to rule over it, along with myriads of angels without number, to offer service. And that's how he created the rest of the realms of light. And he made them to be ruled, and created for them myriads of angels without number to assist. And Adamus was in the first cloud of light that no angel could ever see among all those called <coughs> God. And Adamus begat Seth in that place after the image of, text missing, and after the likeness of this angel. He made the incorruptible generation of Seth appear to the twelve androgynous luminaries. 
And by androgynous, I don't think they mean trannies. I just think it means neither male nor female, but whatever. The 12 androgynous luminaries. And then he made 72 luminaries appear in the incorruptible generation according to the Spirit's will. Then the 72 luminaries themselves made 360 luminaries appear in the incorruptible generation according to the Spirit's will, so that there would be five for each. And the twelve realms of the twelve luminaries make up their father, with six heavens for each realm. So there are seventy-two heavens for the seventy-two luminaries, and for each one of them five firmaments, for a total of three hundred and sixty firmaments. They were given authority and great armies of angels without number for honor and for service, along with virgin spirits, too, for the honor and service of all the realms in the heavens with their firmaments. Now the crowd of those immortals is called cosmos, that is perishable by the Father, and the 72 luminaries with the self-begotten and his 72 realms. That's where the first human appeared with his incorruptible powers. In the realm that appeared with his generation is the cloud of knowledge and the angel who is called Eleleth. After these things, Eleleth said, let twelve angels come into being to rule over chaos and Hades. And look, from the cloud there appeared an angel whose face flashed with fire and whose likeness was defiled by blood. His name was Nibro, which means rebel. Others call him Yaldabaoth. And another angel, Saklas, came from the cloud too. So Nebro, the rebel, created six angels, and Saklos did two, to be assistants. They brought out twelve angels in the heavens, with each of them receiving a portion in the heavens. And the twelve rulers spoke with the twelve angels. Let each of you, text missing, and let them, text missing, generation, text missing, five angels. The first is Yayoth, who is called the good one. The second is called Harmathoth, the eye of the fire. The third is Galila. The fourth is Yobel. And the fifth is Adonias. Excuse me. <clears throat> These are the five who ruled over Hades and are the first over chaos. Then Saklas said to his angels, Let's create a human being after the likeness and the image. And they fashioned Adam and his wife Eve who in the cloud is called life. Now, real quick, uh, this actually does kind of parallel the Genesis account, because if you notice, um, God refers to himself in the plural in Genesis, like we and us and we will do this. I'm just saying it's it's not all that far-fetched, really. But anyway, getting back to it. Uh, fashioned Adam and his wife Eve, who in the cloud is called life, because by this name all the generations seek him, and each of them calls her by their names. Now, Saklas didn't command, text missing, give birth, except text missing among the generations. Text missing, which this, text missing. And the angel said to him, your life will last for a limited time along with your children. Then Judas said to Jesus, how long can a person live? Jesus said, why are you amazed that the lifespans of Adam and his generation are limited in the place he's received his kingdom with his ruler? And Judas said to Jesus, does the human spirit die? Jesus said, this is how it is. God commanded Michael, Michael, the archangel, to loan spirits to people so that they might serve. Then the Great One commanded Gabriel to give spirits to the great generation with no king, the spirit along with the soul. So the rest of the souls, text missing, light, text missing, the chaos, text missing, seek the spirit within you which you've made to live in this flesh from the angelic generations. Then God caused knowledge to be brought to Adam and those with him, so that the kings of chaos and Hades might not rule over him. Then Judas said to Jesus, So what will those generations do? Jesus said, Truly I say to you, the stars complete all these things. When Saklas completes the first time span that's been determined for him, their first star will appear with the generations, and they'll finish what's been said. 
Then they'll sleep around in my name, murder their children, and they'll text missing evil and text missing the realms, bringing the generations and presenting them to Saklas. And after that, text missing, will bring the 12 tribes of Israel from text missing. And the generations will all serve Saklas, sinning in my name. And your star will rule over the 13th realm. Then Jesus laughed. Judas said, Master, why are you laughing at me? Jesus answered and said, I'm not laughing at you, but at the error of the stars, because these six stars go astray with these five warriors, and they'll all be destroyed along with their creations. Then Judas said to Jesus, What will those do who have been baptized in your name? Jesus said, Truly I say to you, this baptism which they've received in my name, text missing, will destroy the whole generation of the earthly Adam. Tomorrow they'll torture the one who bears me. Truly, I say to you, no hand of a mortal human will fall upon me. Truly, I say to you, Judas Iscariot, those who offer sacrifices to Saklas, text missing, everything that's evil. But you'll do more than all of them because you, you will sacrifice the human who bears my spirit. Your horn has already been raised. Your anger has been kindled. Your star has ascended and your heart has strayed. Truly, I say to you, your last text missing and the text missing, the thrones of the realm have been defeated. The kings have grown weak. The angelic generations have grieved and the evil they sowed, text missing, is destroyed and the ruler is wiped out. And then the fruit of the great generation of Adam will be exalted because before heaven, earth and the angels, that generation from the realms exists. Look, you've been told everything. Lift up your eyes and see the cloud with the light in it and all the stars around it. And the star that leads the way is your star. Then Judas looked up and saw the luminous cloud and he entered it. Those standing on the ground heard a voice from the cloud saying, text missing, the great generation, text missing and text missing. And Judas didn't see Jesus anymore. Immediately, there was a disturbance among the Jews, more than text missing. Their high priests grumbled because he'd gone into the guest's room to pray. But some scribes were there watching closely so they could arrest him during his prayer because they were afraid of the people since they all regarded him, Jesus, as a prophet. And they approached Judas and said to him, What are you doing here? Aren't you Jesus' disciple? Then he answered them as they wished. Then Judas received some money and handed him over to them. The Gospel of Judas. Okay. Chew on that for a minute. Um, wow, right? And uh, again, I, I'm not sitting here attesting to any of this. What's up, the polite rebellion? Oh, a tree of life. I thought you said thug life. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dude, Tupac's always in my chat, man. No, <laughs> Okay. Uh, wow. I mean, it really was just a wow. Um, I, I'm not even going to comment on that. I, I'm going to leave commentary for probably another video because there's so much stuff I want to cover in this. And I just want to uh, get this out there and uh, and just let you guys absorb this. Polite Rebellion. Yeah, it's been a while, man. Uh, well, I've been putting content out. Did Globusters earlier today, last several weeks. So I've been around. Um, but yeah, I know uh, YouTube has made it practically impossible to find me anymore. So it's not that like I fell off or anything. I just got blackballed. So thanks, YouTube. That's what you get for five, six years of hard work and, you know, whatever, man. I'm not here for the accolades, but it is uh, a little disheartening to put your effort into something that you want to share with people that just gets uh, buried by an alphabet or whatever. Okay, so that's that for the Gospel of Judas. Let me go back to my notes here. Okay, so uh, now we're going to change gears a bit altogether from the Gospel of, of Judas. But um, just ch so far, just ch I could really end this stream right here. And there's so much to chew on already. Um, 
but uh, hopefully you guys, if you've watched the first five or six videos in this series, you kind of understand where I'm at with this stuff. Um, there's so much more, but uh, man, you know, here's the thing, and I will do some commenting right now. Um, you know, uh, Christianity, uh, the dogmas of Christianity teach us that it is like uh, heretical and blasphemous to, to look into these very scriptures, these texts that we're looking into. And um, I don't think so at all. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, glean from it what you will. What I, what I do think there's something wrong with is uh, following the herd down the broad path with the wide gate. And, and Christ warned us against that. And so b sort of by implication, he's telling us that we're going to need to seek after the truth. It's not going to be something that's just going to be laid at our feet on a silver platter, right? And um, one of the parables that I don't think you find in canon, but is in one of these Gnostic texts, is when you're putting uh, hooks out there and trying to fish for the spiritual truth that you can find in many scriptures, when you, when you strike something that is the truth, you'll know it, you'll be so sure of it that... Okay, let's say you have a sword made of a hard steel, right? And this is this is something that Christ taught to one of his apostles. Um, if you have a, a sword that's of hard steel, and it's of such fine quality that you could stab it through a brick wall, right? How sure would you be that sword would go through, like, the belly of a man, right? You'd be damn sure, right? Well, when when you strike something in these sort of endeavors of revelation, and these endeavors of discernment that... that resonates with you you just know it man i mean it, it really strikes you through and through to be true and what's what what's spiritually true for me may not be spiritually true for you um but uh you know just keep that in mind i mean that that should be your guide and uh, yeah a lot of christians try to teach you that um our spirits are not capable of rational discernment or not capable of uh like discerning between truth and fiction and I would say hogwash. I would say that um, the the travesty and the uh, heresy would be simply believing what's in a book that was written by people trying to deceive you. That is, that's bad. Okay. Um, and in fact, you know, I mentioned it in earlier sections, but Christ taught the Master taught through parables rather than spoon feeding you factoids, right? And in teaching you through parables. It makes the the student a partner in the lesson because you have to think about what's being said and translate that to the actual topic. So it makes you a partner in the lesson and it marries you to that truth rather than just regurgitating something that was spoon fed to you. Right. And I'm 100 percent on board with that. I mean, t dude, Christ was clearly a flat earther or like of that spirit. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, love it. Love him. Love it. Right. OK. So anyway. But anybody that says, like, delving into the Gnostic texts is uh, anti-Christian or whatever, I I'm sorry, dude. I, I think you're way off, way off base. Okay, so um, changing gears now. So I, I would say one of the most important things which Christ led by ex example to his apostles is the respect of women. Now, during the times which Yeshua walked the earth, women had really no place in society, especially in the uh, Hebrew temple, in the hierarchy of the synagogue of Satan, and really not so much in the Roman world either, uh, which in many ways still sort of persists to this day, but in a very sort of echoed and light way, right? Um, the good shepherd often upset his apostles by affording respect and even seniority to Mary, according to certain Gnostic texts who was, by certain accounts, Mary, was the most beloved of all his apostles, okay? Now, let's remember, it was not uncommon for a man back in those days to have multiple wives, several concubines, and even slave girls as a standard protocol. Um, that, that's a big glaring problem for many reasons. I mean, I don't think it's right to own women, right? I think that's a pretty messed up thing. But then let's say dude has five wives, five concubines, and ten slave girls. So he's got 20, uh, 20 women that are all betrothed to him in some way. Well, that means there's 20 dudes out there that are, what, what are they going to be, eunuched, right? Or what, they're just going to walk around, maybe they go and kill dude for one of his wives. I mean, it creates conflict, okay? 
and and I see this as a direct result of the hierarchical um, policies of the synagogue of Satan, which Jesus was sent here to expose, and he did. Okay, so um, the Most High in Genesis created all of the creatures and beasties, animal type by pair, you know, one male, one female, so that they may procreate in their own kind. He created the birds and the bees and the fishes and the fleas and the cats and the dogs and etc. Males and females as the natural order of things. And okay, I don't want to hear about the frogs, whatever, okay, it's whatevs. But that, that was the sort of the standard operating protocol for creating beasties, right? Male and female to procreate after their kind. And yet, we're somehow expected to swallow that the Most High, creator of all things, slipped up and created one man by himself and only created the woman as sort of an afterthought because dude was lonely and he was like, well, maybe he needs a woman too. I mean, to me, that's absurd. I mean, he completely broke the entire creation protocol that was set up quite painstakingly in Genesis, right? Um, now, this could hint of one of two things, and I'll let you be the judge. I, I'm not here to make anybody's mind up for you, but um, it could mean uh, either the book is wrong and men and women were created equal at the same time, not as like one as an afterthought, right? Or, or at least, you know, men and women were created complementary to one another, just as it seems to be the natural order of things, and just as all other creatures were created to complement one another for practical practicality's sake, pragmatism, right? Uh, or, on the other hand, maybe the entity who created Adam was simply not the most the most high. Okay? Chew on that. I, I don't know. I don't have these answers, but um, it, when you start delving into the Gnostic text, this is sort of the philosophy that you begin to unearth. And at first, I got to tell you, it, it is a bit scary, some of the things that you think about, and, and, and humor as a hypothesis, it can get a little bit weird and scary, but I came out the other end of this way more, um, like with a way higher amount of faith and love for the Creator and for Yeheshua and everything. So I promise you it's not like all weird, creepy stuff, but it, you know, it, it is a little bit strange, the things that they make you think about when you read the standard scripture, which again, like, yeah, they created Eve as a out of his rib as an as an afterthought. I'm sorry, dude, that's freaking weird, bro. That's that's weird. Okay, so um, I don't want to get off in the weeds here. So we are going to save that discussion for another video. We could go on and on and on about Genesis. I mean, there is tons of stuff about Genesis that is just really strange. But the fact is. Um, it isn't practical or morally acceptable to treat women as a second-class citizens, concubines, or sex slaves, not just because it's against the natural order of creation, but because it, it creates uh, downstream problems with bastard children. I mean, look at Isiak and Ishmael, I mean, and that whole thing. It creates orphans. It creates divided homes. I mean, there's lots of problems. Um, and frankly, you know, I, I just don't think it's right for one dude to own women uh, you know, putting every dude, every other dude in the in the uh, neighborhood out in the cold, right? I mean, I think that there's something seriously wrong with that. Um, so you know, be be your own judge on that. But I mean, I'm I've got my pr pretty firm beliefs on that. Okay, now I believe it's self-evident that men and women were created to be lifelong partners, and I think it's ridiculous that people think that that you know you could own a woman. I mean, that's absurd. And same thing with any kind of slave. I mean, I don't agree with that mentality at all. I can't even fathom it, right? Maybe I'm wrong here, but I don't think any Hebrew women owned any male slaves, did they? I mean, I never heard of that. You know, Hebrew women just owned men slaves. They could just rape whenever they wanted to. So, you know, there is definitely a double standard here, which was, as far as I'm concerned, utterly destroyed and reversed by the advent of Christ walking the earth. Now, I believe this is very possibly why the Roman church is so adamant on celibacy among its priests, because that suggests sort of subliminally and overtly that Christ was a virgin. Now, there's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm here to tell you, there's nothing sinful about having a wife and loving a woman. It completes a man to wholeheartedly love a woman. And one could even say that you haven't lived until you've completely loved somebody. 
you haven't lost until you've completely lost somebody that you really love. And in any case, how could it be a sin to love a woman and marry her when one of the only commands that God gave us was to be fruitful and multiply, right? But I think that there is something very sacred and special and eternal that transcends this realm when there's a true connection and bond between man and woman. The, the, two, the two spirits become of one flesh, right? And to call that a sin, I think it, that's blasphemy, right? I mean, that, in my opinion, that is the blasphemy is to call that beautiful and natural thing a sin, okay? And also, let's not forget buggering little boys, right? Which Catholic priests are famous for, okay? So let's not forget that. Um, now, perhaps, I'm going to just come out and say it, perhaps Christ was married during his time on this world. Perhaps not. Honestly, it doesn't make a difference to me one way or another. It really doesn't. Couldn't care less. Uh, but it does make a difference to me if canon decidedly covers such a thing up and made it a heresy to even consider such a thing as a possibility. Um, besides, as the Good Shepherd's faith and understanding of the kingdom was so strong and acute, what would his sacrifice have amounted to unless he really had something to lose here on the world? Like, you know, why was he so upset dripping beads of sweat in Gethsemane before the Romans seized him? I mean, he was on his way to fulfill his destiny and sit at the right hand of his father and finally be done with this world and pain and insufferable stiff-necked apostles, right? But if he hypothetically had a woman that he really loved and even dare say children that he cared about immensely, I would submit that would make his self-sacrifice not only actual, but valuable and tangible, substantial, palpable, right? Whereas if he was forced to live here his entire life on earth without knowing a woman, without falling in love, without the love of a woman, where's the sacrifice in that wineskin, right? I mean, really. Now, don't misunderstand me. I I'm not saying one way or another what happened there. I mean, I there's just not enough information. I I'm merely humoring a hypothesis by the order of the master he told us, again, to avoid the broad and well-trodden paths with the wide gate. And the Roman Catholic Church, drunk on the blood of the saints, tells us that Christ was a virgin who never married. Because he never sinned, so he must have been a virgin. And he must have never married, because we all know that marriage is a sin, right? I mean, what? 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 So as a rule of thumb, I tend, uh, by default, towards the opposite of the Catholic dogma. I really do. And so it isn't that out of the question to consider that one of the biggest cover-ups in Christian philosophy is the elevation of women in the world stage to something other than mute playthings for the highest bidder, but instead equal, important, sublime creatures, maybe even uh, you know superior to men in many ways, who definitely at least complement men and make the continuation of our species possible and in many ways make life worth living. And they certainly make sacrifices worth something and they certainly make um life uh, you know worth fighting for you know i'm sorry I, that's just the way that i feel call me crazy uh, but it is certainly agreed that christian tradition considers marriage between one man and one woman for the majority of history anyways as a, a very sublime tenet which is simply not what the ancient hebrews had in mind for their concubines and slave girls right so Something definitely changed with the advent of Christ, okay? Now, how is it that women could be drastically changed with their place in society with the advent of Christianity if Christ didn't think highly of women in some way? And, and I'm not even talking sexually. I'm just talking respected them as people who were not, you know, a flick off the old rib, right? Right. Okay, so, uh, and with that, we're going to go ahead and read the gospel according to Mary. And uh, I think I better plug my phone in here because it's down to 15%. I don't want to start getting funky stuff going on here. Because you know how we really hate the funky stuff around here. Sorry, guys. Gotta hate that funky stuff. Okay, so, the gospel according to... Mary Magdalene, uh, found in the Berlin Gnostic Codex, 
very important and well-preserved codex was discovered in the late 19th century somewhere near the Achmim in Upper Egypt. Purchased in Cairo in 1896 by a German scholar, Dr. Karl Reinhardt, and then taken to Berlin. All the good stuff winds up in Germany, doesn't it? All right. The Codex, as these ancient books are called, was probably copied and bound in the late 4th or early 5th centuries. It contains Coptic translations of three very important early Christian Gnostic texts. The Gospel of Mary, the Apocryphon of John, and the Sophia of Jesus Christ. The texts themselves date to the 2nd century and were originally authored in Zagreek. Okay, and we don't need no more introduction. Here we go. Now, I will say that the first six pages of the Gospel of Mary are gone entirely. So the first three chapters are lost. The extant starts on page seven. Dot, 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 text missing for protocol. Will matter then be destroyed or not? And the Savior said, all nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. For the nature of matter is resolved into the roots of its own nature alone. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And it would be nice to have some context there. We just don't have it, right, guys? I mean, what a shame. Crying ass shame there. Excuse my French. So Peter said to him, since you've explained everything to us, tell us this also, what is the sin of the world? The Savior said, there is no sin, but it is you who make sin when you do the things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. Okay, that is called sin. That is why the good came into your midst, to the essence of every nature, in order to restore it to its root. Then he, Yeheshua, the good shepherd, continued and said, That is why you become sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who, you, who can heal you. He who has a mind to understand, let him understand. Matter gave birth to a passion that has no equal, which proceeded from suf uh, something contrary to nature. Then there arises a disturbance in its whole body. That is why I said to you, be of good courage, and if you are discouraged, be encouraged in the presence of the different forms of nature. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When the Blessed One had said this, he greeted them all, saying, Peace be with you, receive my peace unto yourselves. Beware that no one leads you astray, saying, Lo here or lo there, for the Son of Man is within you. Follow after him. Those who seek him will find him. Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you, and do not give a law like the lawgiver, lest you be constrained by it. When he said this, he departed. But they were grieved. They wept greatly, saying, How shall we go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man? If they didn't spare him, how will they spare us? Then Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, Do not weep and do not grieve, nor be irresolute. For his grace will be entirely with you and will protect you. But rather, let us praise his greatness, for he has prepared us and made us into men. When Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good, and they began to discuss the words of the Savior he had just uttered to them. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior loves you more than the rest of women. Tell us the words of the Savior which you remember, which you know, but we do not, for we have not heard them. And Mary answered and said, What is hidden from you I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak them these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in a vision, and I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. He answered and said to me, Blessed are you that did not waver at the sight of me, for where the mind is, there is the treasure. I said to him, Lord, how does he who sees the vision see it through the soul or through the spirit? The Savior answered and said, He does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, 
But the mind that is between the two, that is what sees the vision, and it is text missing. And then pages 11 through 14 are missing. So another three pages just gone, and it goes right to the middle of chapter 8, verse 10. It's a, it's a shame, man. Okay. Anyway. And Desire said, I did not see you descending, but now I see you ascending. Why do you lie since you belong to me? The soul answered and said, I saw you. You did not see me or recognize me. I served you as a garment and you did not know me. When it said this, the soul went away rejoicing greatly. And again, it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. The power questioned the soul saying, where are you going? In wickedness are you bound? But, but you are bound, do not judge. And the soul said, Why do you judge me, although I have not judged? I was bound, though I have not bound. I was not recognized, but I have recognized that the all is being dissolved, both the earthly things and the heavenly. When the soul had overcome the third power, it went upwards and saw the fourth power, which took seven forms. The first form is darkness, the second desire, the third ignorance, the fourth is the excitement of death, the fifth is the kingdom of the flesh, the sixth is the foolish wisdom of flesh, the seventh is the wrathful wisdom. These are the seven powers of wrath. They ask the soul, whence do you come from, slayer of men, or where are you going, conqueror of space? The soul answered and said, what binds me has been slain, and what turns me about has been overcome, and my desire has been ended, and ignorance has died. In an eon I was released from a world, and in a type from a type, and from the fetter of oblivion which is transient. From this time on I will attain to the rest of the time, of the season, of the aeon, in silence." When Mary had said this, she fell silent, since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her and no further. But Andrew answered and said to the brothers, Say what you wish to say about what she has said. I at least do not believe that the Savior said this, for certainly these teachings are strange ideas indeed. Peter answered and spoke concerning the same things. He questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us men? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer us? Uh, did he prefer her to us really? Then Mary began to weep and said to Peter, My brother, Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I've thought this up myself in my heart or that I'm lying about the Savior? Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot tempered. Now I see you contending against the woman like adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, who are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Rather, let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the Savior taught us. And when he heard this, they began to go forth to proclaim and to preach the gospel of Mary. Wow. So uh, very interesting stuff. And again, you know, I'm not here to attest to any of this. I am just relaying information that is out there. And the fact that it was suppressed so heavily and vigorously by Rome and the, the Hebrew hierarchy, um, just lends credence to it as far as I'm concerned. It really does. Um, that doesn't prove anything. It is circumstantial. But uh, I, I go with my gut anymore, you guys. When, when it comes to uh, things, you know, like uh, topics of the spirit, you're not going to find uh, empirical evidence to support things of the spirit, of course. And so you have to weigh things in the spirit, right? I mean, that's the only way you can do it. Um, but take take the parts of it that you wish to take and leave the parts of it you wish to leave but to reject it offhand and say that you know it's blasphemy to even sit here and talk about it get out of here you talking to me okay so uh let's see here let me go back to my notes here fellers 
So uh, the Gospel of Mary was yet another one of these books that was, if nothing else, was completely omitted from the Christian canon. And by whom? Well, the Roman Catholic Church and the Hebrew hierarchy, the very people who murdered Christ. Right. So the evidence speaks for itself. Since Mary was uh, apparently held in high esteem by Christ and the subsequent dogma banned her writings from canon, it just speaks volumes to my point. And, you know, again, it lends credence to this hypothesis. It is not out of the question that Christ loved that woman deeply and potentially married her. And anyone who claims that I'm committing blasphemy by just stating this hypothesis has completely missed the spirit of my work, has completely missed the spirit of Christ, and is missing out on the spirit of discernment and revelation. Okay? In any case... Uh, back to good old Paul, and in the book of Acts 2.6, uh, we find that the uh, change in gears a, a lot here, you guys, because I'm um, covering a lot of ground, but um, just chew on that Mary stuff for a minute while I light up a cigarette and sip my coffee for just a minute, guys. Bear with me. Ugh. Oh, no way. Hey, babe. Oh, uh, can you grab that lighter over there? This one's dead. Pretty please with sugar on top. I can't even get up. I'm like, got the dog and the phone. And... There's the cigarettes right there. Here, well, you can have that one. Sorry, guys. I I'm still live streaming. So, like, thank you, babes. Appreciate ya. Okay, so, um, okay, so Acts 2-6, we find... Uh, oh, I didn't sip my coffee yet. Sorry. I'm jumping the gun here. We find that the apostles could um, speak and understand any language that was spoken to them in Acts 2, 6, right? Now, this is very interesting to me, just sort of applying some common sense here, right? It's interesting because was it not allegedly God himself who confounded the languages after the story of the Tower of Babel? in the Old Testament. And now Yeheshua, the son of God, is undoing the work of his father. What, what does that mean? I mean, I'll let you decide for yourself, but in my opinion, this supports my theory that the God of the Old Testament was not the most high creator of all things visible and invisible. There's two separate entities here. Um, I mean, I think it's very important to, to state that if you want to, to get to know the spirit of the most high, the only way you're going to get to know him is through the spirit and uh, the uh, countenance of Yeheshua, okay? And so um, Yeheshua is not going to contradict and undo things that his father did, right? So we, we have, you know, just a, another little tidbit of circumstantial, yes, but evidence to support this theory that we have an imposter who wanted to be like the Most High, claim to be the Most High, and even our religious books to this day have him down there as the Most High, in, like the Old Testament, right? Um, and, and again, I'm not saying this is the truth. I'm saying it is a hypothesis that we're humoring. So there you have it. Anyway. It. He just made him understand it. What, babes? He didn't undo it. He, was, he made the apostles understand it. Uh, no, you're, you're, not, you're missing my point, though. I'm not saying uh, God confounded the languages. And when Christ resurrected, the apostles unconfounded the languages. But, but we can't understand it like they could. Well, we're not on fire with the Holy Spirit just yet, are we? Not yet. It's coming. I promise you that. It's coming. Hope you're all ready. Okay, so um, where was I at? So, okay, I'm reading my notes here. So we... We will, la, la, la. okay, so we will know the spirit and countenance of the Most High by knowing that of the Son, Yeshua, the Son of Man, the Good Shepherd, and my Master, our Master. The two will never be in disagreement or in discord, which is the easiest way to gauge whether a spirit is of the light of the Most High or is of the depths of deception. Compare their countenance to that of Christ. Um, and, and that's one thing that I, I will say that uh, even the Romans and the, uh, the Hebrew hierarchy could not stamp out of the teachings. They, they could not completely just tear apart all truth. See, they, they had to deceive, right? They had to take the truth and twist it, okay? 
And so we do know the countenance of Christ, although it appears from these Gnostic scriptures, he had a bit of a more, maybe a little bit darker sense of humor than what is credited to him in the canon. Um, but what he taught was um, something completely different of the mindset of some of the... Um, I, I lost my train of thought. Let me just stick to what I've wrote here, guys, because literally I'm like four hours into this thing now. Um, but again, I, I already did this one. So let me just let me just keep going. I'm confusing y'all. In any case, isn't it interesting that one of the first things that Christ does for his apostles after resurrecting is undo the confounding of the tongues? I mean, that's really interesting to me. So Acts 2.13, um, others mocked and said, these men, speaking of the disciples, they're full of new wine. But Peter said, standing up with the eleven, he said, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So he, um, he you know, and I, you know, honestly, I was going to read through Acts uh, 2.13, but I think I'm just going to pick that up on another section altogether because, again, you guys, I've just done this, and I will leave that as your homework to just go and read Acts, okay? Um, because it's got some really interesting stuff in there. Um, let me just skip that all together because you guys can read that. Let me get back to what I want to tell you from my own little twisted mind here. Okay, so... Um, so Acts 30, I'm just skipping down to the Acts 31. He, seeing this before, spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. And the very day that these things occurred, that they're describing in Acts 2, according to the book, about 3,000 souls were added to the ranks of the anointed or the elect by the Holy Spirit. So they were baptized by the fire of the truth of the Most High and freed from the curse foisted upon many, many generations on this world. So I, I would say some very profound things happened to the actual true church at the point of the resurrection, okay? Things that you're not going to find in any uh, modern Bible. They just, that's something they couldn't have come out, right? So, like, the, they they hint around, like, the, the truth of Christ and how he was the truth and how he embodied the truth and the light and, and all these things. They never tell you what that truth is, okay? And what, what I'm here to tell you is that the apostles were doing miracles and signs and wonders just like Christ. Healing the sick, the lame, uh, casting out demons, uh, walking on water. I don't think so, man. You know, to, to me, I think there's a lot of red herrings in there, too, right? Like water into wine. I don't think so. Because, I mean, remember, um, in the uh, 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, right? Uh, Satan tempts Christ to like, okay, jump off this uh, mountain or whatever, jump off this tower, and surely the angels will save you, right? And he said, well, don't don't tempt the Lord thy God. That's, that's stupid. Why would you do that? Um, it, it's not for the, the, the sort of um, the, the powers of the Most High that are channeled through the Spirit are not for parlor tricks, right? So I would say things like water into wine or, um, I don't know, whatever is tantamount to tempting the Lord that God. Does that make sense? So the point that I'm making here is that if Christ was able to uh, imbue or light the fire of the Holy Spirit that was dormant within his apostles so that they were able to work miracles here in this realm, and the apostles, in turn, were able to add thousands of others in just a sitting, the same thing. This was a huge threat to the boat, right, to the status quo um, in terms of the Roman hierarchy and the Hebrew hierarchy. And so they saw that as a big problem. Um, and I actually touch on this in the, the script that I wrote out here. So let me just let me just read from what I wrote, because it'll be way more on point than my little scattered brained, um, you know, freestyling here, you guys. Um, but in this manner, the true Christian 
true Christian tradition began where everything was um, shared freely between the brothers and the sisters of the church. Uh, there was no hierarchy. There was no brick and mortar building. There was no pope. There was no Vatican, no cardinals. There were simply awakened beings liberated by the good shepherd who could now perform many wonders of healing, mending, teaching, and blessing, casting out demons in the world with the fiery spirit which was unleashed by the master when he ascended from Sheol after three days, having retaken the full authority of the underworld from the archons who had jealously guarded the secrets of the deep for many, many generations of men. And see, I, I think that uh, hypothetically that is the very, very important work of Christ was taking the authority of the underworld back from essentially what you might call demons who had been controlling it since the dawn of time, right? That th this is, I'm trying to just give you some as summaries of what the Gnostic traditions sort of teach, okay? These aren't necessarily my thoughts. This is what I've gleaned after studying this stuff for quite a while now. Um, but so um, the humble apostles gave all the glory to God and the Holy Spirit blazed strong within them. And they were adding thousands to the true church of Christ on a daily basis. Like everywhere they went, they were setting souls ablaze with the Holy Spirit. And the more the authorities tried to quell the expansion of the Holy Spirit, and thus the true church that dwells within us all, the more exponentially it expanded. So they couldn't do nothing to stop it, right? Now, the apostles John and Peter were warned by the Sadducees to cease and desist healing the sick and mending the lame, cease and desist spreading the good news of the resurrection of the dead through the good shepherd. And these guys, well, what did they do? They simply refused. They said hell to the gnaw. They, they are going to continue obeying the will of the Most High and the charges of the Good Shepherd and, and the Holy Spirit which plays within them. And the hierarchy of the Hebrew temple just let them go, uh, that is John and Peter, to avoid further waves in their midst. They just wanted them out of their city, right? They didn't want them around anymore because they were turning everybody into um, whatever this is, whatever this actual christian church appears to have been and and this is what it appears was covered up by the romans and the hebrew hierarchy right they did not want this getting out and and in fact they went to great lengths to um to stamp this out and in fact the only way that they really kind of succeeded was through deception <laughs> right they had to deceive people into moving away from this somehow. But we don't really know exactly how it was done, but we do know things like um, the Crusades and the Inquisition probably had a lot to do with it. Um, we really don't know. And this is where, you know, I mentioned earlier that some of this may tie in with mud flood because we do know that there was a worldwide civilization that was highly advanced, just doing wonderful, beautiful architecture all over the place that was um, spared no expense, appeared to live in luxury, wanted for nothing, were at peace. And at some point, that was all turned on its head, and now we have this sick, sad world that we're stuck with today, right? Well, not if we can help it, right, guys? Right? Okay. So, um, now, a completely new way of living was emerging now at this point in Acts, right, that we're talking about where people were not concerned with their own personal possessions or riches, uh, they would simply share whatever they had to share. And as such, everyone had everything they needed and nobody wanted for anything. Now, you might you know, insult me and say this is a communist manifesto, but then again, we live in a capitalist society, which I completely disagree with that philosophy, right? So let me go pick 12 apples for free and sell them to you uh, suckers for as high as I can get you to pay for them, right? And then we'll, we'll, we'll take it, the capitalists to the next level, like Monsanto, or the company formerly known as Monsanto, and we'll even patent the seeds so that uh, they no longer give seed after one generation, which was actually foretold in prophecy, right? So how spot on is that? Like, how could they have possibly known that? 
Um, but that is the that is the eventual outcome of a capitalist society is um, just greed. It is a society run on greed. So if you agree with that, then I, I'm sorry, I disagree with you. And I think it makes more sense for people to just love each other as you love yourself and share. <laughs> right. And I, I know that sounds funny coming from. Yeah, shut up, beat taco junkie. What's up, Orlo, man? Love you, brother, bro. I'm I'm so glad you're here, man. Wow. Yeah, but you are a sucker. <laughs> you're a terrible capitalist, man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad I noticed you in there. I didn't know you were there, bro, bro. Love you, man. Uh, okay. So, all right. Uh, but I do disagree with the capitalist philosophy. And so the Christian church began a tradition of sharing with your brothers and sisters freely. Whatever you have to share. If you had nothing of physical value to share, perhaps, you know, one had other talents, which would be a blessing to the group. Maybe you're a great poet or a healer or, you know, a massage therapist, whatever. I don't know. Not a Vietnamese massage therapist. Get your mind out of the gutter. The point is the Christian church was turning the status quo on its very head. You know, the status quo that was making the Sadducees and the Pharisees very rich. Rome was getting kickbacks. Um, by the way, look into, uh, I think I mentioned this before, but remind me one day, or remind myself, note to self, Scythopolis. Scythopolis. It was a city that was essentially just wiped off the map right around the point where uh, maybe Jericho uh, stood. Okay. Scythopolis, the Siths. Keep that in mind, man. Something very, very important about them. They were just wiped out, covered up. And I think that may also tie in just beautifully to the Tartarian mud flood thing. I suspect that it will. And uh, research is very difficult on it. I think in all of the internet, you can find like two paragraphs on them. But um, these guys essentially ran all of Damascus, right? For a long, long time. Anyways, uh, back on point here, guys. All right, so... The point is, the Christian church was turning the status quo on its head. That much we can be sure of. And the hierarchy of Rome and the Hebrews, how did they feel about this? Well, they weren't exactly jovial, right? Not stoked. Not happy about it at all, you guys. Let's just say that for a shizzle, right? Okay, and right at the point of Acts 5.5 5 is where I opine that Paul, the murderer of Christians for fun and mammon, began infiltrating the church. For at this point, a married couple, their names were Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their home and their land and they gave it to the burgeoning church, the, the church with the, that was now exploding, right? But they kept some portion of that money back from the sale of their home and their lands for themselves. A little nest egg, right? Not much. They gave the majority of it to the church. They kept a little money for themselves. And they were promptly struck dead and buried, not by the apostles, but by the Holy Spirit. They were struck dead and buried, one after another, in the presence of the apostles. Don't even bother trying to resurrect them. Don't even bother trying that. So we have here in Acts 5.5 5, eh, a bit of a contradiction. Okay, So in the first four chapter of, uh, chapters of Acts, we have the apostles who are healing the sick, raising the dead, convincing people to sell their belongings and share it with the church freely. And now, all of a sudden, if newcomers to the church fail to give every last penny to the church, they're going to be struck dead and don't even bother trying to resurrect them. Now, these were decent people trying to do the right thing by their church and their family. This is not of the spirit of Christ, but it reeks of the infiltrator who was backed and emboldened by what appears to be a fallen angel now trying to run things within the church. Okay. Now I just, uh, I, I've always had trouble with that little portion of the story, the Acts 5, 5. And, you know, Christians who are all into their hermeneutics will apologize for it all day long, but that is a glaring problem where it, it is more evidence to my theory here that the church was infiltrated by Paul, backed by a very high fallen angel. And of course, subsequently, Paul is responsible for what we have today that is the known Judeo-Christian Bible. That's a problem. If, if the narrative that I'm sort of spelling out for you here is at all true, what this means is we have a big fat problem in the church, you guys, big problem. And I'm not just talking about hermeneutics. 
I'm not just talking about the Roman Catholic dogma being slightly different jots and tittles than the Orthodox dogma or the, um, you know, the, uh, can't even think, like the uh, Baptist or the, uh, the Separatist dogma. We're talking about whole cloth deception that are coming in Christ's name in order to deceive the mass, masses down the road to death deception. Okay, That's a huge problem. And, and dude, Christ told us this was going to happen. Okay, He knew it was going to happen. We all knew it was going to happen. And yet Christians still go right down the broad path, through the broad gate, whistling past the damn graveyard like it's nothing, man. I, I just don't get it. Oh, but but what I'm doing here is blasphemy, really? I'm sorry, man. If you if you really say that to me, you're not a Christian, dude. You are you are deceived. You are deluded. And I'm not trying to insult you. I'm trying to wake you up. Grow your ears out, okay? Please. And, and this is all food for thought. It, it gets so much deeper, you guys. But suffice to say that the only possible way that the apostles could have been open to deception and demonic attack by the fallen ones would have been if they had indeed murdered Judas Iscariot, okay? Now, I'm not saying this is what happened unequivocally, but as far as I'm concerned, it's the only thing that makes any degree of sense to me. And so for my hypothesis, I'm going to claim that it is highly likely that the apostles, at least one or maybe all, at least some portion of the apostles, murdered Judas in cold blood, revenge for turning in Christ ultimately replacing him with Matthias, who Matthias indeed knew Yeshua and during his, uh, knew Yeshua during his ministry and witnessed the resurrection. So Matthias was like a bona fide apostle, right? By all definitions. And yet Matthias is never mentioned ever again in the New Testament. Doesn't have any books in there, never mentioned but one time. And yet Paul writes half of the 26 books in the New Testament. And again, Paul never never met the guy, never knew him, and literally murdered Christians for fun and for mammon. Okay. Now, the apostles continued to heal the sick, cure the blind, cast out demons, raise the dead, and ultimately spread the fires of the Holy Spirit far and wide, spreading the good news of Christ to all corners of the world. Now, when the Sadducees uh, tried to lock them up in prison, because that's what anyone would do with such awesome pillars of the Holy Spirit, right? Oh, lock them up. <laughs> like, what? But uh, it, uh, they would just be let out, right, by angels. So it was decided that trying to imprison them, punish or kill the apostles was counterproductive. For every apostle you jailed, they would be freed by angels, and everyone that you martyred would be replaced by hundreds or even thousands of new emissaries of the Most High. Okay? Now, one such emissary was Stephen... And, you know, I was going to read of Acts 6.15 through Acts 9, which is all about Stephen. And there's some real interesting stuff in there. But I'm not going to read that all for you, you guys, right now. I'm going to leave that up to you or maybe for another time. Because we really have beautifully covered uh, the points that I wanted to cover. And I could only just sort of hammer them home more with that. Um, but what I will do is as a sort of bonus that I was not going to do before is I am going to read the Gospel of Thomas. This is uh, Thomas Didymus, who was also known as Doubting Thomas. Um, dude does not have a book in, in the New Testament, and yet he walked with Christ, knew him, was there for the resurrection. Bonafide apostle, doesn't get any, any say whatsoever in the books. And, of course, we're fed the line that it's because, well, he didn't write anything. But in truth, it's because Rome and the Hebrew hierarchy went to great lengths and efforts to stamp out these books, right? Now, uh, just a little preface, the, the Gospel of Thomas is absolutely nothing like what you'll find the Gospel of the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the, the main canon. Um, in fact, like... Uh, let's put it this way. Christ did not go around saying he was born of a virgin. As far as I can tell, he never said it, never claimed it. He never went around saying that he was the only begotten son of God. Never said that. Never said he was God on earth. Um, he, it was not important that he was born under this star or that star. This was all to fulfill Jewish prophecy so that he could be accepted by them and let into a position where he could expose them as the synagogue of Satan, if anything. But that wasn't what was important to Christ at all. 
meant nothing to him, okay? And so the Gospel of Thomas is strictly and only parables that Christ taught to Thomas. And I think it's a wonderful thing because there's some stuff in there that is echoed in the standard, um, you know, canon. And there's some stuff in there that you, that's never heard ever before. And I think it's very beautiful. So I will read that for you. And that will be the last, um, the last portion that I'll do tonight. All right. So here we go. Let me just pull this up real quick. You guys bear with me one second. And uh, the Gospel of Thomas, incidentally, is part of the Nag Hammadi scriptures or Nag Hammadi uh, library, which I gave you a little bit of background at the beginning. And where is it? Where, 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 where? The Gospel of Thomas. Now, there is one translation of this that's very, very beautiful. I can't remember which one it is. I think it is the Patterson and Meyer, but I can't remember. So I'll just go with Patterson and Meyer translation. And this is the Gospel of Thomas, translated by Stephen Patterson and Marvin Meyer. These are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. And he said, whoever discovers the interpretations of these sayings will not taste death. And Jesus said, uh, I guess I should separate these because they're not like a linear thing. These are all just like separate things, okay? So one, two, Jesus said, those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. When they find, they will be disturbed. When they're disturbed, they will marvel and will reign over the all. And after they have reigned, they will rest. Three, Jesus said, if your leaders say to you, look, the Father's kingdom is in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it's in the sea, then the fish will beat you to it. Rather, the Father's kingdom is within you, and it is all around you. When you know yourselves, then you will be known, and you will understand that you are the children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you live in poverty, and you are the poverty. Four. Jesus said, the person old in days won't hesitate to ask a child seven days old about the place of life, and that person will live. Honestly, I could never make sense of this. But one thing that I found is um, this, uh, let me just stop this for a second and say, the Gospel of Thomas was the very first Gnostic text that I looked into. And I, I did find that when I read through this and, and sort of meditated on it and chewed on it and read through it a couple of times and even read it aloud is very important, I think. Man, revelations just just started pouring into me, man. And I'm not saying it's anything but promises fulfilled by the Most High and His Son, man. Um, so j just in your own time, maybe do this yourself, read this yourself. But I, I am going to read it to you, so let me just shut up. I'll keep going. But that one makes no sense to me. I'll read it again because it's a little bit weird. So four, Jesus said, the person old in days won't hesitate to ask a little child, even seven days old, about the place of life, and that person will live. For many of the first will be last and will become a single one. Hmm. Five, Jesus said, know what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you. Hmm. For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and there is nothing buried that will not be raised. His disciples asked him and said to him, Do you want us to fast? How should we pray? Should we give to charity? What diet should we observe? Jesus said, Don't lie, and don't do what you hate because all things are disclosed before heaven. After all, there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and there is nothing covered up that will remain undisclosed. Seven, Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat, so that the lion becomes a human, and foul is the human that the lion will eat, and the lion will still become human. Eight, and he said, the person is like a wise fisherman, who cast his net into the sea and drew it up from the sea full of little fish. Among them, the wise fisherman discovered a fine, large fish. He threw all the little fish back into the sea and easily chose the large fish. Anyone here with two good ears had better listen. 
Jesus said, look, the sower went out, took a handful of seeds and scattered them. Some fell on the road and the birds came and gathered them. Others fell on the rock and they didn't take root in the soil and didn't produce heads of grain. Others fell on thorns and they choked the seeds and worms ate them. And all others fell on good soil and it produced a good crop. It yielded 60 per measure and 120 per measure. 10. Jesus said, I have cast fire upon the world, and look, I'm guarding it until it blazes. 11. Yeshua said, This heaven will pass away, and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive, and the living will not die. During the days when you ate what is dead, you made it come alive. When you are in the light, what will you do? On the day when you were one, you became two. But when you became two, when you become two, sorry, what will you do? So I should probably read that again, but I'm just not, because there's so many of these, you could read them over and over again, and eventually it just doesn't make sense. It just does something. I don't know. It's just, it's weird, man. There's something about these that just kind of just, it boils in you, right? I don't know. 12, the disciples said to Jesus, we know what you're going to leave us, or we know that you're going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Yeshua said to them, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was not James the just uh, Yeshua's brother, like older brother? I think so. Maybe not. Anyway, Yeshua said to his disciples, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. Simon Peter said to him, you are like a just messenger. Matthew said to him, you are like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. Jesus said, I am not your teacher because you have drunk. You have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. And he took him and withdrew and spoke three sayings to him. When Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, what did Jesus say to you? Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me and fire will come from the rocks and devour you. 14. Yeheshwa said to them, if you fast, you will bring sin upon yourselves. And if you pray, you will be condemned. And if you give to charity, you will harm your spirits. When you go into any region and walk about in the countryside, when people take you in, eat what they serve you and heal the sick among them. After all, what goes into your mouth will not defile you. Rather, it's what comes out of your mouth that will defile you. Amen to that. Uh, one thing, you guys, is, uh, and you know, J Jaronism uh, was a big champion for the rice experiment, right? You guys remember that, the rice experiment? Dude, y'all, speak blessings out to each other and out into the world. Don't speak curses. And I, I'm guilty of it, too. I'm terrible about it. But if, if we all just uh, just make a little bit of an effort to speak blessings rather than cursings out into the world, I, I, I think um, what a wonderful world it'll be, right? Oh, pardon me. i got to get this out of the way. Okay. But, uh, uh, okay, so... Rah, 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 rah. Yeah, what goes into your mouth will not defile you. Rather, it's what comes out of your mouth that will defile you. And, and you know, I could I could go back, I could go through these and tell you like what my interpretation of many of these are, and maybe one day I will. But I, I just want y'all to just think of these things, okay? Just just hear them, right? Or don't, whatever. Uh, Jesus said, uh, fifteen. He said, when you see the one who has uh, who was not born of woman, fall on your faces and worship. That one is your father. Sixteen. Jesus said. Perhaps people think that I have come to cast peace upon the world. <laughs> they do not know that I have come to cast conflicts upon the earth, fire, sword, and war. For there will be five in a house. There will be three against two and two against three, father against son and son against father, and they will stand alone. Mm. 17, Yeheshua said, I will give you what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no hand has touched, what has not arisen in the human heart. 18. The disciples said to him, Tell us, how will our end come? And he answered, 
Have you found the beginning then that you are looking for the end? You see, the end will be where the beginning is. Congratulations to the one who stands at the beginning. That one will know the end and will not taste death. 19. Yeheshwa said, congratulations to the one who came into being before coming into being. <laughs> if, you come, if you become my disciples and pay attention to my sayings, these stones will serve you. For there are five trees in paradise for you. They do not change, summer or winter, and their leaves do not fall. Whoever knows them will not taste death. 20. The disciples said to him, tell us what heaven's kingdom is like. And he said to them, It is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. But when it falls on a prepared soil, it produces a large plant and becomes a shelter for the birds of the sky. 21. Mary said to Jesus, What are your disciples like? And he said, They are like little children living in a field that is not theirs. When the owners of the field come, they will say, Give us back our field. They take off their clothes in front of them in order to give it back to them, and they return their field to them. For this reason, I say, if the owners of a house know that a thief is coming, they will be on guard before the thief arrives and will not let the thief break into their house or their domain and to steal their possessions. As for you, then, be on guard against the world. Prepare yourselves with great strength so the robbers can't find a way to get to you, for the trouble you expect will indeed come. Let there be among you a person who understands. When the crop ripened, he came quickly, carrying a sickle, and harvested it. Anyone here with two good ears had better listen. 22. Jesus saw some babies nursing, and he said to his disciples, These nursing babes are like those who enter the Father's kingdom. They said to him, Then shall we enter the Father's kingdom as babies? And he said to them, When you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make the male like the female into a single one, so that the male will not be male, nor the female be female, when you make eyes in a place of an eye, a hand in a place of a hand, a foot in a place of a foot, an image in the place of an image, then you will enter the kingdom. Hmm. And that's a, there's different translations of this. That's a very, very bizarre translation there, I think. But I, I'll read that one again. No, I've already said I'm not going to do that. So 23, sorry, guys. We're just going to one-shot it, okay? 23, Jesus said, I, I shall choose you one from a thousand and two from 10,000, and they will stand as a single one. 24, his disciples said, show us the place where you are, for we must seek it. And he said to them, Anyone here with two ears had better listen. There is light within a person of light, and it shines in the whole world. If it does not shine, it is dark. 25. Yeheshua said, Love your friends like your own soul. Protect them like the pupil of your eye. 26. Yeheshua said, You see the silver in your friend's eye, but you don't see the timber in your own. When you take the timber out of your own eye, then you will see well enough to remove the silver from your friend's eye. 27. If you do not fast from the world, you will not find the Father's kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath, you will not see the Father. 28. Yeshua said, I took my stand in the midst of the world, and in flesh I appeared to them. I found them all drunk, and I did not find any of them thirsty. My soul ached for the children of humanity, because they are blind in their hearts and do not see. For they came into the world empty, and they also seek to depart from the world empty. But meanwhile, they're drunk. When they shake off their wine, then they will change their ways. 29. Yeheshua said, if the flesh came into being because of spirit, that is a marvel. But if the spirit came into being because of the flesh, that is a marvel of marvels. Yet I marvel at how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty of flesh. 30. Yeheshua said, Where there three, I'm sorry, where there are three deities, 
they are divine. Where there are two or one, I am with that one. 31. Yeheshwa said, No prophet is welcome on his home turf. Doctors don't cure those who know them. 32. He said, A city built on a high hill and fortified cannot fall, nor can it be hidden. 33. He said, What you will hear in your ear, in the other ear proclaim from your rooftops. After all, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, nor does one put it in a hidden place. Rather, one puts it on a lampstand so that all who come and go will see the light. And Yeheshua said, 34, If a blind person leads a blind person, both of them will fall into a hole. <laughs> damn right. I just got to say, damn right on that one. <laughs> 35, he said, um, One cannot enter a strong person's house and take it by force, without tying his hands. Then one can enter to loot his house. Yeah. 36, he said, do not fret from morning to evening and from evening to morning about your food or what you're going to eat or about your clothing, what you're going to wear. You're much better than the lilies, which neither card nor spin. As for you, when you have no garment, what will you put on? Who might add to your stature? That very one will give you your garment. And he's not talking about clothing. He is talking about the flesh. Just a second. 37, his disciples said, When you then you will see the son of the living be afraid. And again, He's, I'll just tell you, he's speaking in parables. He is not talking about getting naked, which, you know, nothing wrong with walking around naked. But in this society, you'll probably go to just, just understand that at least, right? There will be days when you will have taken the keys of knowledge and they have hidden them. They have not entered, nor have they allowed those who want to do so. As for you... Be as sly as snakes and as simple as doves. 40. Yeheshua said, A grapevine has been planted apart from the Father. Since it is not strong, it will be pulled up by its roots, and it will perish. 41. Yeheshua said, Whoever has something in hand will be given more, and whoever has nothing will be deprived of even the little they, they do have. Damn right. 42. Yeheshua said, be a passer-by. 43. His disciples said to him, Who are you to say these things to us? You don't understand who I am or from what I say to you. Rather, you have become like the Judeans. For they love the tree but hate its fruit, or they love the fruit but hate the tree. <laughs> 44. Yeshua said, Whoever blasphemes against the Father will be forgiven, and whoever blasphemes against the Son will be forgiven. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either on earth or in heaven. 45. Yeheshua said, Grapes are not harvested from the trees. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Grapes are not harvested from thorn trees, nor are figs gathered from thistles, for they yield no fruit. Good persons produce good from what they've stored up. And bad persons produce evil from the wickedness they've stored up in their hearts and say evil things. For from the overflow of the heart, they produce evil. 46. From Adam to John the Baptist, among those born of women, no one is so much greater than John the Baptist that his eyes should not be averted. But I have said that whoever among you becomes a child will recognize the Father's kingdom and will become greater than John. 47. Yeheshua said, A person cannot mount two horses or bend two bows. <laughs> Damn right. And a slave cannot serve two masters. Otherwise, that slave will honor the one and offend the other. Nobody drinks aged wine and immediately wants to drink young wine. Young wine is not poured into old wineskins, or they might break, and aged wine is not poured into new wineskins, or it might spoil. An old patch is not sewn onto a new garment, since it would create a tear. 
Hmm. 48. Yeshua said, If two make peace with each other in a single house, they will say to the mountain, Move from here, and it will move. 49. Yeheshua said, Congratulations to those who are alone and chosen, for you will find the kingdom, for you have come from it, and you will return it to it there again. 50. Yeheshua said, If they say to you, Where have you come from? Say to them, We have come from the light, from the place where the light came into being by itself, established itself, and appeared in their image. If they say to you, Is it you? Say, we are its children, and we are the chosen of the living Father. And if they ask you, what is the evidence of your Father in you? Say to them, it is motion and it is rest. 51. His disciples said to him, when will the rest for the dead take place, and when will the new world come? And he said to them, what you are looking forward to has already come, but you do not know it. 52. His disciples said to him, Twenty-four prophets have spoken in Israel, and they all spoke of you. And he said to them, You have disregarded the living one who was in your presence, and have spoken of the dead. 53. His disciples said to him, Is circumcision useful or not? And he said to them, If it were useful, their father would produce children already circumcised from their mother. Rather, the true circumcision in spirit has become profitable in every respect. 54. He said, Congratulations to the poor, for you belong in heaven's kingdom. Or, I'm sorry, for to you belongs heaven's kingdom. 55. Yeheshua said, Whoever does not hate father and mother cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not hate brothers and sisters and carry the cross as I do will not be worthy of me. 56. Yeheshua said, Whoever has come to know the world has discovered a carcass. And whoever has discovered a carcass of that person, the world is not worthy. 57. Yeheshua said, The Father's kingdom is like a person who has good seed. His enemy came during the night and sowed weeds among the good seed. The person did not let the workers pull up the weeds, but said to them, No, otherwise you might go to pull up the weeds and inadvertently pull up the wheat along with them. For on the day of the harvest, the weeds will be conspicuous and will be pulled up and be burned with ease. 58. Yeheshua said, Congratulations to the person who has toiled and who has found life. 59. He said, Look to the living one as long as you live. Otherwise, you might die and then try to see the living one, and you will be unable to see. 60. He saw a Samaritan carrying a lamb and going to Judea. He said to his disciples, That person around the lamb. They said to him, So that they may kill it and eat it. He said to them, uh, wait a minute, let me start this over because I think I just butchered this. I don't know. 60. He saw a Samaritan carrying a lamb and going to Judea. He said to his disciples, that person around the lamb. They said to him, so that they may kill and eat it. He said to them, he will not eat it while it's alive, but only after he has killed it and it has become a carcass. They said, otherwise he can't eat it. And he said to them, so also with you, seek for yourselves a place for rest or you might become a carcass and then be eaten. <laughs> wow. 61. Yeshua said, Two will recline on a couch. One will die and one will live. Salome said, uh, Salome said, Who are you, mister? You have climbed onto my couch and eaten from my table as if you are from someone. Yeshua said to her, I am the one who comes from what is whole. I was granted from the things of my father. She said, I am your disciple. And for this reason, I say, if one is whole, one will be filled with light. But if one is divided, one will be filled with darkness. Yeshua said, I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. 63. 
He said, uh, there was a rich person who had a great deal of money. And he said, I shall invest my money so that I may sow, reap, plant, and fill my storehouses with produce that I may lack nothing. These were the things he was thinking in his heart, but that very night he died. Anyone here with ears to hear had better listen. 64. He said, a person was receiving guests. When he had prepared the dinner, he sent his slave to invite the guests. The slave went to the first and said to that one, My master invites you. And that one said, Some merchants owe me money and they're coming to me tonight. I have to go give them instructions. Please excuse me from the dinner. So the slave went to another and said to that one, My master has invited you to dinner. That one said to the slave, I have bought a house and I have already been called away for a day. I shall have no time. The slave then went to another and said to that one, My master invites you. That one said to the slave, My friend is to be married, and I am to arrange the banquet, and I shall not be able to come, so please excuse me from the dinner. The slave went to yet another and said to that one, My master invites you. And that one said to the slave, I have bought an estate, and I am going to collect the rent. I shall not be able to come. Please excuse me. And the slave returned and said to his master, those whom you invited to dinner have asked to be excused. The master said to his slave, Then go out on the streets and bring back whomever you find to have dinner. Buyers and merchants will not enter the places of my father. 65, he said, and I guess maybe he means capitalists there, huh? Capitalists? I don't know, man. Nothing against capitalists, but uh, when you let it run you, man, I, I really do disagree with that. Sorry. Okay, so uh, 65. Should I do the rest of these in a, in a shaman accent? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> 65, a text missing. Person owned a vineyard and rented it to some farmers so that they could work it and he could collect his crop from them. He sent his slaves to the farmers. He sent his slaves so the farmers would give him the vineyard's crop. But they grabbed him, beat him, and almost killed him. And the slave returned and told his master. His master said, Perhaps he didn't know them. So he sent another slave, and the farmers beat that one as well. Then the master sent his son and said, Perhaps they'll show my son some respect, because the farmers knew that he was there for the, uh, the heir to the vineyard. So they grabbed him, and they damn right killed him. Anyone here with two ears had better listen. The Keystone 67. Yeheshua said, those who know all but are lacking in themselves are utterly lacking. 68. Yeheshua said, Congratulations to you when you are hated and persecuted, and no place will be found wherever you have been persecuted. <laughs> 69. Yeheshua said, Congratulations to those who have been persecuted in their hearts. They are the ones who have truly come to know the Father. And congratulations to those who go hungry. I'm damn hungry right now. I'm just going to be honest. So congratulations, you go hungry. So the stomachs of the one in want may be filled. Agreed. I totally agree. Uh, Yeheshua said, if you bring forth what is within you, what you have will save you. If you do not have that within you, what you do not have within you will kill you. 71. Yeheshua said, I will destroy this house and no one will be able to build it. Text missing. 72. A person said to him, Tell my brothers to divide my father's possessions with me. And he said to the person, Mister, who made me a divider? And he turned to his disciples and said to them, I'm not a divider, am I? <laughs> Rhetorical. 73. Uh, Yeheshua said, the crop is a huge one, but the workers are few. So beg is the harvest, wait a minute. So beg the harvest boss to dispatch workers to the fields. Seven, let me read that again because I did butcher it. 73, Yeheshua said, the crop is huge, but the workers are few. So beg the harvest boss to dispatch workers to the fields. 74, he said, Lord, there are many around the drinking trough, but there is nothing in the well. 75. Yeheshua said, There are many standing at the door, but those who are alone will enter the bridal suite. 
76, Yeheshua said, the father's kingdom is like a merchant who had a supply of merchandise and found a pearl. That merchant was prudent. He sold the merchandise and bought the single pearl for himself. So also with you, seek his treasure that is unfailing, that is enduring, where no moth comes to eat and no worm destroys. 77. Yeheshua said, I am the light that is over all things. I am all. From me all came forth, and to me all attained. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stump. Okay. Sorry, we lost connection there. As they say in the old Dublin town, a fuck a doo doo. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so I guess we're back live. Okay, so Yeheshua said, Why have you come out to the countryside? To see a reed shaken by the wind? And to see a person dressed in soft clothes like your rulers and your powerful ones? They are dressed in soft clothes and they cannot understand the truth. 79. A woman in the crowd said to him, Lucky are the womb that bore you and the breasts that fed you. And he said to her, Lucky are those who have heard the word of the Father and have truly kept it. For there will be days when you will say, Lucky are the womb that has not conceived and the breasts that have not given milk. 80. Yeheshua said, Whoever has come to know the world has discovered the body, and whoever has discovered the body of that one of the world is not worthy. Wait a minute. I said that wrong, so let me say that again. Sorry, y'all. Yeshua said, Whoever has come to know the world has discovered the body, and whoever has discovered the body of that one, the world is not worthy. Similar one was mentioned early, but I think it just said carcass instead of body, right? Similar. 81. Yeheshua said, Let one who has become wealthy reign, and let one who has power renounce. 82. Yeshua said, Whoever is near me is near the fire, and whoever is far from me is far from the Father's kingdom. 83. Yeheshua said, Images are visible to people, but the light within them is hidden in the image of the Father's light. He will be disclosed, but his image is hidden by his light. Yeheshua said, When you see your likeness, you are happy. But when you see your images that came into being before you and that neither die nor become visible, how much will you have to bear? Mm. Let me read that one again. 84. Yehesh. Sorry. Let me check on something here that comes in every, every time you hear the Zelda. I don't know if y'all can hear that. Um. What I say, okay, so 84, Yeheshua said, when you see your likeness, you are happy, but when you see your images that came into being before you and that neither die nor become visible, how much will you have to bear? 85, Yeheshua said, Adam came from a great power and a great wealth, but he was not worthy of you, for he had, had he been worthy, he would not have tasted death. 86, Yeheshua said, Foxes have their dens and birds have their nests, but human beings have no place to lay down and rest. 87. Yeheshua said, How miserable is the body that depends on a body, and how miserable is the soul that depends on these two. As in double, like not these also, but these two things, right? Let me say it again. How miserable is the body that depends on a body? And how miserable is the soul that depends on these two things? Mm. Yeshua said, The messengers and the prophets will come to you and give you what belongs to you. You, in turn, give them what you have and say to yourselves, When will they come and take what belongs to them? Damn right, man. Damn right. Amen. 89. Yeshua said, Why do you wash the outside of the cup? Don't you understand that the one who made the inside is also the one who made the outside? 90. Yeheshua said, Come to me, for my yoke is comfortable, and my lordship is gentle, and you will find rest for yourselves. 91. They said to him, Tell us who you are so that we may believe in you. 
And he said to them, You examine the face of heaven and earth, but you have not come to know the one who is in your presence, and you do not know how to examine the present moment. Mm. 92. Yeshua said, Seek and you will find. In the past, however, I did not tell you the things about which you asked me then. Now I'm willing to tell you them, but you are not seeking them. 93. Don't give what is holy to dogs, for they might throw them upon the manure's pile. Don't throw pearls to pigs, or they might... Text missing, it text missing. <laughs> they might muck it up into poo-poo, I would say, probably, but I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, 94. Yeheshua said, One of the... Uh, I'm sorry. One who seeks will find, and for one who knocks, it will be opened. Amen. And it's true, man. It really is true. 95. Yeheshua said, If you have money, don't lend it in at interest. Rather, give it to someone from whom you will not get it back. 96. Yeheshua said, The father's kingdom is like a woman. She took a little leaven, hid it in a dough, and made it into a large loaves of bread. Anyone here with two ears had better listen. 97. Yeheshua said, The Father's kingdom is like a woman who is carrying a jar full of meal. While she was walking along a distant road, the handle of the jar broke, and the meal spilled out behind her along the road. She didn't know it. She hadn't noticed a problem. But when she reached her house, she put the jar down and discovered that it was empty. 98. Yeheshua said, The Father's kingdom is like a person who wanted to kill someone powerful. While still at home, he drew his sword and thrust it into the wall to find out whether his hand would go in it. Then he killed the powerful one. 99. The disciples said to him, Your, uh, your brothers and your mother are standing outside. He said to them, Those here who do what my father wants are my brothers and my mother. They are the ones who will enter my father's kingdom. A hundred. They showed Jesus a gold coin and said to him, The Roman emperor's people demands taxes from us. And he said to them, Give the emperor what belongs to the emperor. Give God what belongs to God. And give me what is mine. Hundred and one. Dalmatians. <laughs> whatever does not hate the fa... Uh, whatever... Uh, la, la, la. Whoever does not hate father and mother as I do cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not love father and mother as I do cannot be my disciple. For my mother, text missing, but my true mother gave me life. Hmm. <clears throat> 102. Uh, Yeheshua said, Damn the Pharisees. They are like a dog sleeping with the cattle in the manger. The dog neither eats nor lets the cattle eat. Precious. <laughs> 103. Yeheshua said, Congratulations to those who know where the rebels are going to attack. They can get along, collect their imperial resources, and be prepared before the rebels arrive. Right on, bro. Right on, man. 104. They said to Yeheshua, Come on, let us pray today and let us fast. Yeshua said, What sin have I committed or how have I been undone? Rather, when the groom leaves the bridal suite, then let people fast and pray. 105. Yeheshua said, Whoever knows the father and the mother will be called the child of a whore. 106. Yeheshua said, When you make the two into one, you will become children of Adam. And when you say, Mountain move, from here, it will move. 107. Yeheshua said, The Father's kingdom is like a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. One of them, the largest, went astray. He left the ninety-nine and looked for the one until he found it. After he had toiled, he said to the sheep, I love you more than the ninety-nine. 108. Yeah, weird. Um, okay, sorry. Um, 109. Yeheshua said, The Father's kingdom is like a person who had a treasure hidden in his field but did not know it. 
and when he died, he left it to his son. And the son did not know about it either. He took over the field and sold it. The buyer went plowing and discovered the treasure and began to lend money at interest to whomever he wished. 110. Yeheshua said, damn, right? I, just, I just love that one, man. I really do. I love that. 110. Yeheshua said, let the one who has found the world and has become wealthy renounce the damn world. Yep. 111. Yeheshua said, the heavens and the earth will roll up in your presence, and whoever is living from the living one will not see death. Does not Jesus say those who have found themselves of them, the world is not worthy. 112. Yeshua said, Damn the flesh that depends on the soul. Damn the soul that depends on the flesh. Mm. 113. His disciples said to him, When will the kingdom come? He said, It will not come by watching for it, for it will not be said, Look here or look there. Rather, the Father's kingdom is spread out upon the earth, and people just don't even see it saying probably added to the original collection at a later date in parentheticals there 114 simon peter said to them make mary leave us for females don't deserve life yeshua said look i will guide her to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males for every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven and that's the end of that. Um, so, you guys, I think that's going to wrap this up. The The next thing that I'm going to do, um, you know, I would do it tonight, man. And if I was to do it tonight, it would be a separate stream so that we keep them separated, like Offspring said, because I want this to be something separate than that, is uh, Second Ezra. And, and the only reason, it, it's still in this sort of uh, same vein that it was, uh, 2 Ezra was uh, omitted from the New Testament. So, like, it is not in the, uh, you know, like the Torah, the New Testament version of the Torah. And uh, if I'm saying that right, this is whatever. But uh, 2 Ezra, it, it just, uh, and it, again, it is Old Testament stuff. So, you know, whatever, hate me if you will. But I, I think that there is some very good, just wonderful stuff to be gleaned from Old Testament. But two Ezra spoke to me. Well, you by a show of comments, guys, do you want me to read it? It's pretty long. I can at least start it. And what I would do is start a new stream and do it. Just uh, I'd have to get like to, there's 36 people watching now, according to YouTube. Like 10 of you would have to say yes. Start reading two Ezra. Like, and I'll give it a minute to catch up. So let me light up a cigarette and strap shoes on my feet. Yeah, and uh, while I'm waiting for that response, ne Rich Spillman, next time, yeah, I'm pretty tired, man. But uh, yeah, so like uh, the the Gnostic philosophy is very interesting once you grasp it, um, and it makes a lot of sense. And there's evidence for it in scriptures. I mean, it's just everywhere. Once once you start looking for evidence to support the Gnostic sort of philosophy, um, it just becomes obvious. I mean, it really is all over the place. Time for bed. Oh, Ezra, smoke break. Yes, indeed, I like it. Bedtime. So it's getting mixed results. So okay, so based on the first five, and I'm sorry to cut you guys off, uh, y'all, but uh, two Ezra will be the next thing. I, I think I'll live stream it. I had a lot of fun interacting with you guys, so I'll do that next time. I'm very tired. I haven't slept in days. Um, big shout out to uh, uh, Cali Tree Farm, Daryl, man. Uh, my, my boy looked out, and um, man... I'd be in the streets fucking dead if it weren't for that dude, I'm telling you guys. I mean, there, there's a handful of y'all out there, you know who you are, that have uh, really helped. And I, you know what, man? I've pissed a lot of people off. I know I have. I've pissed a lot of people off. But honestly, I would rather piss a lot of people off and live to tell this tale than to die loved by all, right? I mean, I really would. I mean that uh, wholeheartedly. And me, honestly, I could really care less about my myself like i'm ready to die i've been ready to die for a long time and I, i'm not suicidal or anything but i wouldn't it's no skin off my ass if i die right this second honestly but i have um, my butt mud and, and my wife that i i do care about and i guess they would miss me if that happened so um really thanks out to cali tree farm daryl man uh, dr shada bro love you bro and um orlando um meat taco junkie love you bro 
Um, the, uh, oh, Tiffany Vinci, I don't think she, I saw her in the chat, but I guess she will probably watch this Love You Girl in a totally platonic way. Although, if anything, if things get uh, off the rails with you and Mr. Vinci, holla. No, I'm kidding. I just totally, I'm sorry. I'm bad. I'm going to hell. Okay, guys. Well, I love you. I'm going to wrap this up. I had a, a real good time. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully, this will be meaningful to at least one of y'all. And I hopefully, um, all of you standard um, broad path, broad gate Christians are agitated and pissed about this. You know, look into this and, and try to prove it wrong. You know, that's, that's the best way to test something. And, and if it doesn't resonate with you, fine. That's fine. I'm not saying my opinions are right, but I, see, I would rather err on the side of caution when it comes to spiritual truth, okay? So I would rather err on the side of questioning dogma uh, f for risking being heretical, whatever the hell that means, rather than disobey the master's command and trod that narrow, crooked path with the hidden gate, right? I mean, he told us we're going to have to do this sort of thing. And he even told us that people are going to just downright hate us for it. And so as a flurfer, I wear that as a badge of honor. I love being a flurfer. Um, I can take it. And as long as there's one of y'all out there willing to listen to me, man, I'll, I'll keep doing it. As long as, uh, you know, God willing, as long as the, the, the Most High wants me to do it. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, more content to come. Flat Earth content is in the works. Also, I, I've got recording done, just not rendering done for the audio book, The 13 Bloodlines of the Illuminati. So that's a bit of a change of pace from some of this stuff. But uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, hopefully it finds you well. And, um, uh, you know, just one last comment. I remember for years I thought of Gnostic as evil. Like the terms are synonymous, right? Gnostic is evil. It is anti-Christian. It is um, new age nonsense, right? That's what the weaponization of this thing is. But when you realize that has been a long road to hoe for the Antichrist, the Roman hierarchy and the Hebrew hierarchy, they've gone to great lengths to make that happen. And you start to realize that they're, the Gnostics were actually the true Christians in my opinion, that that's where I'm at. And their philosophy is amazing. And if what is spoken of in Acts is true, we need to strive for that, okay? And I think we can do it, you guys. The, 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 the spirit is here, it's, it's here now. We just have to, um, we've got to stoke it, we've got to share it with people, we've got to get it out there. And what I mean by that is, especially to Christians, um, and, and to Muslims. I mean, this isn't, this is not something that is for any race of people or any religion. This is for everybody, you guys. Um, you know, so enough, enough of that. I'm rambling. I'm really tired, you guys. So I'm going to go to bed hungry. I'm fasting, not by choice, but because I'm living way beyond my means in a, in a hotel. It's either that or homeless. So, uh, thank God for that. And I think I'm going to go eat my shoe and go to bed. Now I got some pita bread chips over there, so I will eat that. I'm not totally starving, but Hey man, there's people got it way worse than me. So please forgive me for being such a whiner. Love you guys. i uh, see you soon. And, um, wow. How, how's that for uh, just a terrible wrap up? Meh. <laughs>